All right, shall, uh, shall we get started? So uh, first thing I need to do is apologize that I don't have the best photos from assignment number two ready, but I promise that I will show them to you on Wednesday. Uh, so there's been a change in the schedule. There is uh, something that I need to be away from uh, lecture from next Monday. So we're going to do a little switcheroo here. And on Monday, um, well, uh, the noise in ISO lecture will be on Wednesday instead of Monday. And then on Monday, there will be um, two uh, guest lectures. The first lecture will be by Jesse Levinson on night photography and astrophotography. That was already scheduled. But that will be half of the lecture. And then the other half will be Florian Kainz, who you've heard in the back of the classroom, uh, who comes to us from Industrial Light and Magic and has four Academy Awards, talking about special effects and trick photography. And I think you'll really enjoy that. And uh, then on Wednesday, we'll, um, we'll resume then with noise and ISO and then continue the next week as before. Okay, so no, nothing canceled, just a, a little shift. All right, so today we're going to talk about sampling theory. So throughout the course, there's this sort of alternation, you may have noticed, between a little bit of theory and then applications in photography. This will be another of those. Today we'll talk about sampling theory and just a little bit about how it affects photography. And then on Wednesday, we'll talk about sensors and anti-aliasing filters and a lot more practical applications. We'll do this several more times in the course. For example, when we talk about color, we'll talk first about color theory and three-dimensional color space and tristimulus matching functions. And then uh, on that Wednesday, we'll talk about applications uh, of color, gamut mapping and browsers and things like that. Uh, all right, so the kinds of questions that we're interested in answering uh, from sampling theory that are applicable to photography are things like what are the moiré artifacts that we see in photographic images? And what is an anti-aliasing filter? How many megapixels are enough? <laughs> we can talk about that, but we can talk about it quantitatively. So we can talk about um, retinal resolution, um, whether uh, Apple's retina display is just hype. We can talk about the circle of confusion a little bit more precisely than we did in depth of field. Uh, the modulation transfer function curves, I left those out of the lens lectures. Let's talk about them now. Um, and then what uh, is actually done in a program like Photoshop for upsizing and downsizing. Uh, and then the question of quantization as opposed to sampling. And we'll distinguish those two and talk about the, the different artifacts that they produce. So uh, here's the outline for today. We'll talk about frequency representations of images. So let me just get a show of hands. How many people here know Fourier analysis? Okay. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, okay, so about half. Uh, all right. Um, we're going to do this mainly at a qualitative uh, level. Just to make sure every, everyone's up to speed, I apologize to those who already know it cold and for whom this is just at best a review. We'll talk about the resolution of displays and the human visual system and how they relate. Uh, and we'll talk about circle of confusion. And then we'll talk about aliasing. And aliasing in space and time and ways to prevent it. And then finally, uh, although we may not get to it today, we'll talk about sampling versus quantization. OK, so let's get started. And uh, we'll dive right into frequency representations of images. So this is a great illustration from a computer graphics textbook that shows the very simple fact that if you take um, sine of x and add sine three of th uh, sine three x over three, it begins to look not like a sine wave anymore. And if you keep adding sine five x over five and so on, it begins to look very different than a sine wave. It looks like a square wave, and this. Uh, the intent of this diagram is to sort of show you that using sums of sinusoids of different amplitudes and frequencies, you can approximate other functions. And that's the basis for, the uh, for Fourier analysis. Uh, moreover, um, you can shift those horizontally by adding 
cosines or combinations of sines and cosines. And you can easily see that because if we take a sinusoid and we add to it a cosine, and let's just take an even mix of those two, I have to normalize it by dividing by the square root of two, you'll get something that looks exactly like both of them but is halfway between them horizontally. And so by adding a weighted sum of a sine and a cosine of the same frequency, you can shift things. And so that, those intuitions are um, formalized in the Fourier transform. So this is an orange slide in my course at Stanford. The students are not responsible for this on the exam because that's the level of the course that I teach at Stanford. Um, but all it really says is a sum of sines and cosines so that you can shift things with different weights on each and different frequencies. That's the N. Can approximate, uh, there's some, some normalization, can approximate any function. That's all the Fourier transform says. Okay? So let's look at some Fourier transforms. So there's an image on the left and there's uh, part of its Fourier transform on the right. It's uh, Actually, I think it's the real part in this case. Uh, you can think of it as being just the sine or just the cosine if you'd like. It's half of the Fourier transform. So the way to interpret this is let's just look at one spot uh, in the Fourier transform. The angle between it and the horizontal says that we w are talking at that point about sinusoids that run up at that angle. In other words, they look like that. The distance from the origin gives the frequency. The further away it is from the origin, the finer these sinusoids are. Finally, how bright the, the uh, Fourier transform is at that point says the amplitude. And it's as simple as that. So as another example, there's one that is uh, on the uh, x-axis, so uh, its sine waves are in x. It is higher frequency, so they're closer together. And it's weaker. It's a dimmer pixel in this transform. So uh, the amplitude is less. And that's really all there is to it. Um, the complete spectrum, as I said, is two images, sines and cosines. I'm only showing one of them. And I computed this image using those three lines of MATLAB. So um, you can do that yourself. It's fun to, to look at the Fourier transforms of images. So let's build a little intuition for things you can do with uh, these spectrum. So in particular, um, that's a spectrum of an object that has some high frequencies and some low frequencies. Let's look at something that has very, very high frequencies, like where's Waldo? So look at what its spectrum looks like. You go back. There's the flower. There's where's Waldo. It's got a lot more high frequencies, and it literally is true in the spectrum. There's more stuff around the periphery. The in the middle is the zero frequency, sometimes called the DC term. Gives the average intensity of the image. Okay, so let's play some more games. Suppose we were to erase the outer part of, oops, suppose we were to erase the outer part of the spectrum. So those are the high frequencies. If we erase them, that's what we get. So these are, I computed these using MATLAB from uh, just erasing the outer part of the spectrum. It's as simple as that. Um, back to the original flower, and let's increase the contrast of the pixels around the edge here in the spectrum, and then we'll convert it back. That sharpens the image, as you would expect. So I'm increasing the amplitude of the high frequencies. So it's really a very simple intuition once you buy the notion that you can approximate images as sums of these sines and cosines of different angles and frequencies. All right, let's play another game. What does this filtering operation do? So there's the original. So what's that going to do? Just based on the examples that I've shown you so far. What's that? 
restrict the angle. So what it, what's the image going to look like on the left? So it's going to stay sharp. Actually, uh, I think it's more sharp in this direction and more blurry in this direction. And so that's what it looks like. And is this just an eraser, or, or are you also increasing the something on the parts? Uh, on the top and bottom, I also brightened it. Okay. Yeah. So um, before, after, and this is what I see all the time without my glasses. <laughs> Do we have an isotropic blur? Um, but also sharpening on top and bottom, not just an anisotropic blur. So it's astigmatism. That's what I see all the time. OK. So just with this intuition, we can now talk about modulation transfer function uh, as it affects photography. So if you look at a lens review, they'll talk about these MTF curves. And the way to think about it is very, very simple. You can look at uh, sine waves of different frequencies, or if you prefer, you can look at a square wave or bar pattern, which, as you know now, can be computed as the sum of different frequencies. But let's just talk about the sine wave. And any lens system will pass the lower frequencies pretty well, but at some point will begin to fail on the higher frequencies. And fa by fail, what I mean is it won't pass them with the same amplitude. It will attenuate the high frequencies. So it will lower their contrast or lower the amplitude of those components. So if we look at amplitude as a function of the freak, uh, as a, sorry, if we just look at a scan line plot through, I guess this is right through there. Oh no, actually it looks like this one's the bar pattern. So a, a, a scan line plot right through there. We can see what's happening. Those uh, square waves are becoming lower in amplitude as their higher frequency components are attenuated. And we can draw that loss of contrast like this. This shows that the contrast is down by a factor that's 10 to the 1, so the contrast is down by a factor of 10. And that is what an MTF curve is, very simply. It's how much uh, the lens system attenuates frequency, certain frequencies. OK, so if I tried to sell you two lens systems, And we'll call this um, frequency, and we'll call this the MTF. And one of them does this diagrammatically, and the other one does that. And which one would you buy? What are the frequencies? What's that? What are the frequencies? That's a good question, actually. <laughs> Qualitative. <laughs> Just depends on the depends on the sensor. You got you too smart. <laughs> All right. So it, they do different things, and one of them will be oh right okay. Uh, those are the causes of the loss of MTF. I've already said that. Um, so the one that cuts off the frequencies is essentially blurring. Right, it's losing those high frequencies. The one that goes down gradually is losing contrast, but it's maintaining frequencies all the way out to the end. And so we can look at what those look like roughly here. Sharpness versus contrast. So here is um, an image that, here's the original image. I don't know if you can see those words. This is blurring, so that's a loss of frequencies. So that would be the more the step one. and there's loss of contrast. And so that would be this one, kind of approximately. Actually, I think the one on the bottom has lost some resolution as well. But those might be two different lenses. The loss of contrast could be due to scattering, for example, inside the lens, glare, or inside the camera body. So we can restore that to a certain extent. If we think of this in the frequency domain, this one would be relatively easy to restore. We just boost them. The problem is when you boost these frequencies, you will also boost noise. Uh, this one, if it's really zero at the bottom, we can't restore. 
if it is more like a real lens, it probably looks a little bit more like that. It doesn't go right to zero. We can boost it again to some extent, but we will also enhance noise. And so this is from Cambridge in color. I didn't compute these, so I don't know the uh, mathematical method that was used. There's on, on the top again the, the poor resolution and the poor contrast, and there's some kind of restoration of the poor resolution. So obviously the frequencies were not taken to zero, um, and there's a boost of the, the contrast. So, yeah, is it backwards? Are we going to have to change the uh, contrast with this resolution? The, the, the contrast and resolution labels, I think, are correct. Sorry about that. You're absolutely right. But the, the two images are corresponding. Mix. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I will fix that. Um, but look at the ringing. So this is a common thing as well when you start to restore lost resolution. Ringing means overshooting. So there will also be enhancement of noise. You can't see that here. Uh, we would have to blow it up, and it would depend on the lighting levels as well, but there will be an enhancement of noise. We'll talk about that more when we talk about noise. Uh, okay. So um, any image can be uh, described as some sines and cosines, and we can enhance or reduce high or low frequencies. Attenuating high frequencies is sometimes called low-pass filtering. Attenuating low frequencies is sometimes called high-pass filtering because we're passing the high frequencies or blurring and sharpening. And then the modulation transfer function preserves uh, um, describes how well an optical system preserves frequencies. Any burning questions so far? Salman? Is it possible to build a brick wall filter like that optically? A brick wall filter? You mean this one here? Yeah, it's in there. <laughs> uh, let's see, an interference <laughs> filter sort of does that, but it, that's more selective. It's just like one frequency. Uh, so maybe a multi-coding thing could do something like that? Yeah, that's an interesting. He's asking whether you can build an optical system that does that. All right, let's check the uh, Dory. Uh, nope, nothing yet. Okay. Question. Um, do your eyes also have the MTF? Yes, your eyes definitely have an MTF. So are you getting double MTF? Or yes, you absolutely are, uh, depending on the magnification. And we'll talk about retinal acuity shortly. But your eye is an optical system, it definitely has an MTF. And we, and we can talk about whether it's diffraction limited and so on. Uh, sorry? So for color images, are you doing a separate spectral analysis in each of our GMB? So we'll talk about color images next time. Um, but there is a separate system in the human visual system for red, green, and blue, roughly. And the same thing in, um, uh, yeah. Oh, so when you see an MTF curve, um, an MTF curve. Or just spectral, like Fourier analysis. Um, I guess an MTF curve could be uh, specific to a wavelength. They typically don't actually do that. Yeah, I, I don't but see they that. They do give you two curves that give you the two different both orthogonals. The orth. So, so, so typically, an, if you actually see a lens MTF curve, there will be like three different frequencies. The, the three different colors will be shown in the MTF curves for lenses. One pair for each one of them, which are the Sagittal and tangential. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, right. that, that's what an actual MTF curve has. It's like you know, 5, 10, and 20 line pairs per, per millimeter. Mm. Like that goes to the higher settings. Okay. All right. So let's talk about spatial resolution now of media. So there are several ways we can talk about that. One simple way is to simply talk about the pixel, pitch, right? So the density of that would be one over that, whatever the pixel pitch is. So as an example, this MacBook Air right here is 900 pixels high on a seven inch display. So that's measured vertically here. Um, and so each pixel is 0 0.0078 inches, or the flip of that is 129 dpi. Dots per inch. Okay, so, um, 
Line printers are typically at least 300 dots per inch, and that's why we don't like reading on laptops. They are nowhere near the resolution of a line printer. Uh, but let's look at the Kindle. So this is the Kindle 2. That's the e-paper display. It's 800 pixels on a 4.8 inch display. So it's a little bit higher. It's 167 DPI, but it's still only half of what a line printer is. The most recent e-paper displays are higher. All right, I should fix that then. I will do that. I'll add, I'll add a more recent Kindle. Yeah, the slide's a little bit out of date. Uh, here is uh, the original iPad. So that's even worse. That's 132. But I do have an update for that one. So there's an iPad 3, which is 240, uh, 204.8 pixels high on the same size display. So that's 263 DPI. So that's getting close to uh, a, a line print. And I have a few other examples later as well. Uh, OK. So what happens? How does this relate to retinal acuity, to what we see? And so a way to think about that is instead of talking about pixels, let's talk about sinusoids. Uh, if you'd like, you can relate that to pixels by saying that every pair of pixels is one sine wave period, uh, a dark pixel and a light pixel next to one another. And then the question is, uh, all right, so we'll assume, we'll talk about the period of the sine wave, which is two pixels. And we'll keep that factor of two in mind. Uh, and then the question is, when that enters the eye and focuses on the retina, what is the angular uh, subtense that it makes on the retina? And so that, of course, depends on the viewing distance. And so now our examples are going to have to include a particular viewing distance. So there's the MacBook Air, viewed this, this one, viewed at... 18 inches, okay? <laughs> and let's work out the numbers. So we already decided it's 0.0078. Um, and we'll multiply that by two for the sinusoid, assuming two pixels are required to make one of those sinusoids. The retinal arc for that using that viewing distance is 0.05 degrees for one of those waves. And so the spatial frequency on the retina is 20 cycles per degree. So if I stand here and look at this laptop, I'm getting 20 cycles per degree on my retina. Okay? So now the question is, what is the human visual acuity? So like any question in psychophysics, there's an awful lot of, well, but it depends. So first of all, it depends what part of the eye you're talking about. Uh, there is this one part of the eye called the fovea. It's about one degree in a uh, retinal arc. So that's about your thumbnail at arm's length. So all of your reading is done with uh, part of your retina that is thumbnail sized at arm's length. Isn't that amazing? That's why you have to keep saccading, which means shifting your gaze quickly when you read, because you're reading through something the size of your thumbnail. Um, there's a great, uh, let's see, so the Air Force did this experiment to try and do a retina resolution flight simulator by having a wide projector, wide angle projector display with a foveal inset. And the foveal inset was a separate display. It was very small because they knew what that fovea subtense was. Moved with a galvo or something like that, a mirror, very, very fast in concert with the gaze changes in your eye as tracked by a contact lens with a gold reticle across it. Ew. Uh, I have never seen one of those. I'm not enamored of the idea of a uh, contact lens with a gold, uh, gold reticle on it. Uh, but they claim that it was, uh, it made it seem to the observer as if it was retinal resolution everywhere. So you can do these sort of inset displays. But let's put that aside. That's not all that practical. Um, and although you can imagine it possibly being useful in the future of head-mounted displays. And uh, another factor we have to talk about is contrast. So we can see 
contrasty sinusoids better than we can see low contrast sinusoids. And so empirical measurements look like this. So uh, it's a chart that shows uh, increasing frequency in that direction and decreasing contrast in this direction. Now, I don't know what you see, but I sort of see a curve of um, visibility that kind of rises and then falls again over here. Now, of course, this is completely screwed up by the projector and all the other things that are going on here. This is not how we would actually conduct the psychophysical experiment. But a psychophysical experiment will show something like that, exactly like the curve I just traced out. So here is increasing spatial frequency. And here is increasing contrast sensitivity, which means I can detect things. Th 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 this peak here means that I can detect things that are of lower contrast at that frequency than I can, let's say, at that frequency. And the cutoff is roughly at about 50 cycles per degree for high contrast stimuli. OK, so let's go back. Um, hmm. Looks like this is not equal to retinal acuity. Not terribly surprising. So compare that, for example, to this extreme photograph that I showed earlier in the course uh, that's hanging in uh, Gates Computer Science Building in Stanford. And it is originally a roughly a gigapixel image. The print uh, in Gates Hall is 72 uh, inches wide. And so if we work that out and view it, let's say, at 48 inches, um, 20,000 pixels, 36 high inch high print, blah, 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 232 cycles per degree. So that's much finer than human acuity. We don't need something that high. So let's do one more example, and that's the iPad Pro. So the iPad Pro is 2048 pixels on a 7.8 inch high display. Uh, it's 263 DPI. So that's very close to a line printer, not quite a line printer. If viewed at 18 inches, it's 41 cycles per degree. So it's almost retina resolution, not quite. All right, so now we have a feeling for the resolution of things, and we have a feeling for what humans are capable of. Let's put the two together and apply it to photography by thinking about the circle of confusion, something that we talked about earlier in the course. So the maximum allowable circle of confusion can be computed now from human spatial acuity depending on what your display medium is. And that and will also depend on viewing distance. So let's work out an example. Uh, photographic print viewed at 12 inches. The maximum um, human acuity is about 50 cycles. So we got that already. The detectable retinal arc, then, the reciprocal of that will be about 0 0.02 degrees. And so the minimum feature size uh, at 48 inches will be about 0.1 millimeter. So, sorry, 12 inches. So at 12 inches, we look at a print, we should be able to detect something that's 0.1 millimeter. So I've got a photographic print here of the statue of the Lao Koan in Rome. Uh, the priest Lao Koan and his two sons being killed by snakes for giving away the, um, uh, no, it wasn't the Trojan War. It was uh, something between Sparta and Athens, but uh, I may have that wrong. Uh, okay, so um, let's work it out for that. So 5 by 7 print. Let's assume the picture is taken by this. So the Canon 5D Mark III. So 5 inches high divided by the pixel resolution of this camera um, would be that each pixel on the camera would be 0 0.03 millimeters on this print. So let's put aside the question of whether I can actually make a print that fine. And let's just assume that it's a, this magical print medium. The, um, what that says is this is, this is finer than what I can see. So if I'm making a 5 by 7 print from the Canon, the ratio of those two is about 
And that means that the blur could be about three pixels wide before I would see it. And if that's true, then that could be our circle of confusion for depth of field. If we were taking a picture on this and we knew we were going to print it five by seven here. So that's the way to think through depth of field circle of confusion. Know your final display medium, know your viewing distance, and you can compute that. Again, imagining that there's no limitation on the resolution I can make a print. And so the circle of confusion, uh, if we want to compute it in microns, would be the size of a pixel on that camera, which is 6.3 microns, multiplied by that allowable number of pixels, which is the ratio between these two numbers. And that's 20 microns. So if we want to stick it into the depth of field formula, it's 20 microns would be the number we would stick into the depth of field formula. People see now how all of that fits together? Good. Um, so to recap, we can talk about spatial resolution of the display medium as pitch or density. We can talk about the effect on human observers by retinal angle or retinal frequency in cycles per degree, which depends on viewing distance. And we can, if, if we assume the human uh, spatial acuity is 50 cycles per degree on the retina, which does depend on contrast, then we can convert it back to pixel pitch, and then we can compute from it circle of confusion. Again, assuming a particular display medium and a viewing distance. Questions? Reviewing distance 3x the picture height. Um, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, 3x the picture height. Um, for it depends, of course, on the aspect ratio, but that does sound reasonable, actually. Yeah, I like that. It's a good rule of thumb. I think I'll put that on my slide. Great rule of thumb, 3x picture height. Probably down to a very large yeah, yeah, of course, picture height. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> You may be staring closely at your phone. I can't focus that close. Right. Uh, focusing uh, distance decreases linearly with age, <laughs> no matter how healthy you are. And so I hold my phone a little bit further away. But that is also a smaller display. So right. it compensates for some of your uh, Until you're really old. <laughs> Your comfortable field of view wants to encompass yeah, the entire yeah, photo, yeah. right? Right. Uh, let's see if the Doris has anything. What? Still no? Yeah, it's quiet. As an aside, it's a good way to figure out how big a TV you should get. Actually. How big a TV you should get, depending on the size of your living room, <laughs> right? Right. Right. Yeah. And with the phone, the aspect ratio is the exact opposite because it's in the portrait. So you might do instead of doing three x. Oh right. You might do three x width. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And that would actually explain why people are holding it then even closer because the width is much shorter than the young people either. anyway. Right. <laughs> right. Of, co of course, you realize that that doesn't uh, th that doesn't apply to cardboard because cardboard has additional optics in between so that you're actually like this. So we're talking about unaided viewing, except for a pair of glasses if you have one. Okay. Um, there are no questions? Let's go on. So let's talk about sampling and aliasing. So if you have a sine, sine wave, it's pretty obvious that if I wanted to sample this at discrete intervals, in such a way that you would know when uh, you received those samples that it was this particular frequency that you ought to sample it fairly often. And so, for example, you might think, well, it's at, l at least this often. Seems like an obvious intuition. And it should be just as obvious that if I don't, if, if I sample, let's say, only this often, 
something like that, then I'm going to get something that is wrong. And that something that's wrong is always a lower frequency. And so aliasing is high frequencies masquerading as low frequencies due to insufficient sampling. You can use that as a technical definition of aliasing. So an example I like to give for this is I have two transparencies that have very fine screens on them of opaque and transparent lines. I know you can't see that. But if I hold them up and rotate them with respect to one another, I bet you do see that. Even the camera should be able to pick that up. Those are moiré patterns. And what it is is high frequencies masquerading as low frequencies due to insufficient sampling. Effectively, what's happening is you can think about one of them as being the frequency we'd like to reproduce and the other one as being the sampling of it because it's uh, alternating opaque and transparent. And uh, the word I just said, in case you have never heard it before, moiré. So aliasing like this occurs in many contexts. There's a great Java op applet, which I cannot show on this laptop because it's corporate laptop and security prevents me from doing it. I tried it last night. Um, but you can go to this website and you can play with the rotation of that and you effectively get the same moiré patterns that I just showed you with the transparency. Um, so the same thing happens temporally. Uh, there's another demo there, but let me try it myself. So one way to think about temporal aliasing is let's suppose we have a uh, um, make it a little bit smaller. Suppose we have a wheel. And it's a wagon wheel in an old Western movie. And the wagon wheel is rotating clockwise over time. And we have a movie camera with a, um, that samples just very briefly. has a very short shutter time and then takes a long time to pull down to the next frame of film because it's a very old movie camera. This is all true about these movie cameras. So it may only do something like a point sample in time. You see what's going to happen there? It's going to appear to be rotating the other way. That's aliasing. It's high frequency, which is the fast rotation clockwise, masquerading as a low frequency, which is the slow rotation counterclockwise due to insufficient sampling. You don't see it as much on today's movies, first of all, because there aren't as many westerns, and second of all, because the exposure time is longer. They can pull down faster. Uh, and so uh, they replace it with a blur, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, yeah, I, someone brings this up, the, the car wheels going backwards on the highway every year, and we have lots of arguments about this because there's no sampling that's happening there, so you shouldn't see that unless there is, you're at night and there's lighting that has a particular frequency, or unless there's a wheel cover, as uh, I think Jaguars and some other cars have, that is effectively sampling something that's inside, but if it's daylight... Uh, if it's daylight and it's um, just simple wheel cover, you shouldn't see it because the eye does not point sample in that way. Yeah, at night on the Bay Bridge. Because the lighting has some frequency, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> you should be paying attention to the road ahead of you. <laughs> okay. And the old span. For, for the, uh, I think it's actually called the Willie Brown Bridge. It's the western space. 
Okay, so the same thing happens in audio. And this is, again, a Java applet that I can't show you. But there are lots of demos of this on the web where uh, if you sample sufficiently frequently, you'll correctly reproduce the audio waveform. And if you don't take enough samples, it will alias as a lower frequency, which is a lower pitch in audio, and you'll begin to hear that alias. And it's a great, simple demonstration. Okay, so we can be specific about what that sampling rate needs to be. And the Nyquist criteria is that rule. And it says the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theory and the Nyquist rate say that the um, uh, sample should be spaced 1 over 2n apart, where n is the highest frequency present in uh, the signal. And so n it comes right out of that Fourier transform that I showed you earlier. So the, rate, the frequency of sampling should be more than twice the cutoff, meaning the highest frequency that's present in the signal. And that kind of makes sense. I showed that here. Uh, oh, in the, um, my original example of a sinusoid, it's sort of intuitive that we, if we want to reproduce this, we should sample the top and the bottom, for example. Or we could sample here and here, and that would work instead. Uh, if we sampled here and here, there's that uh, degenerate case. And it is for that reason that it says more than rather than more than or equal to. Equal to would be called critical sampling. So you want it to be more than. And as long as it's more than, you will somehow pick up the rhythm of the rising and the falling, and you ought to be able to do a, um, you ought to be able to reproduce it. It won't look like a different frequency in particular. Okay, let's apply this back to the human visual system. So the human retina consists of discrete cells that are looking at the world and an optical system focusing onto them. Therefore, the retina ought to be doing sampling. And if sampling theory says this, and if our um, observed uh, cutoff is 50 cycles per degree, then we must have a sampling system that's got 100 samples per degree, or 100 of those little retinal cells per degree. And lo and behold, this agrees with retinal cell spacing. If you take a micrograph of the human retina, and you look at the fovea, and you look at the long and medium cones, the short, so you can think of those as red and green. We'll come back and talk about that when we talk about color. The spacing is about 30 arc seconds. So a degree is divided into 60 arc minutes, which is divided into, in turn into 60 arc seconds. So it's about 1 120th of a degree. So the sampling rate is 120 samples per degree, which is roughly twice the empirically measured acuity of 50 cycles per degree. Isn't that cool? Uh, <laughs> Zalman says it's very interesting that we evolve this way instead of evolving over sampling. Actually, it looks like we do over sample a little bit. And there's uh, lots of other stuff that's going on here because we don't have a regular mosaic. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I don't talk about here is uh, vernier acuity. Our ability to detect, I think I may talk about it a little bit later, but um, our ability to detect small offsets is much greater than our uh, sampling rate would suggest. Uh, and there's that great uh, uh, example in the Exploratorium of a very fine little crack and crank it down and until you can't detect it anymore. And it's amazing how small a crack you can detect. And the same thing is true here. It's partly due to the fact that it's an irregular mosaic and partly due to the fact that there are decisions made over large sets of cells, which is sort of like anti-aliasing. Uh, okay, so let's talk about aliasing in photography now. So a lens creates a focused image on a sensor. Uh, suppose that the sensor only measured this points, uh, only measured this image at points. In other words, suppose it did point sampling the way we've been discussing. What would that look like? And so let me take my favorite image uh, at this resolution and let's point sample it at a lower resolution. So it would get that. Now, so you might not be able to see from where you're sitting how bad that looks, but just look at the text. It really breaks up. 
It looks like something different. That's aliasing. Okay, how do you prevent aliasing? So the standard answer is you pre-filter to avoid aliasing, meaning you filter before you sample. And in particular, you have to remove or at least attenuate the sine waves that do not obey the Nyquist rate. So it's very straightforward to do that if you think in the frequency domain. Remember this decomposition. This is what happens if you don't. This is computer graphics now. Um, if you do pre-filter it, you get an image like that. And so what it's actually done in this case is it's removed those high frequencies, left in the low frequencies, and that produces an average color of gray. And that's the right answer here. There's nothing else you could do given the sampling rate you have except to fade it into gray. In fact, if you don't even remove them entirely, I can see some moiré there left. You have no choice but to remove those high frequencies if you want to avoid these aliasing artifacts. Okay, how can you do that? You can do it in the frequency domain, which follows directly from the previous slide. So you take the image, convert it to the frequency domain, remove the frequencies above that cutoff, replacing them with gray, with an a their, uh, the average, convert it back to the spatial domain, and perform point sampling as before. That would work, except that these conversions are slow, and it's not clear how you would do that in a camera before you perform the sampling. That means in analog somehow. But there's an easy spatial domain way to do it, which is to blur it using spatial convolution and then apply the point sampling. These two are mathematically equivalent. How many people know that fact? How many people know the convolution theorem? Okay, so a smaller num somewhat smaller number than the, than the number who know about 40. That, that's fine. So I'm not going to prove that here, but these two are mathematically equivalent. Um, multiplying in the frequency domain, in this case uh, multiplying by a number less than one so that we attenuate those high frequencies, is equivalent to convolving in the spatial domain. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me quickly show you what convolution is. I'm, I imagine that everyone here does know convolution, but just in case, uh, I, I can go through it uh, fairly quickly. So we'll start with a convolution in 1D. Here's the input signal. There's the formula for it, but let's work, l let me show it graphically. There's the signal that I'm going to convolve, and there's the filter. Notice that it says 2, 1, and this has x minus k, and so it actually flips. So now it's 1, 2, and then it just says 1 times 1 plus 3 times 2. Yeah, 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 it said that. And then it moves over and does the same thing again. So that's a 3, and that's, that is spatial convolution. Uh, all I'm doing is I'm implementing this formula here. Here's the way you denote it, uh, a, s a discretely sampled signal, so written with a square brackets, f of x, convolved with another one which we can call the filter if we'd like, the pre-filter, is this summation. And I'm just computing the summation down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how much longer this goes on. All right, enough. So that's one-dimensional discrete. There's also a continuous version of this, which is an integral, but it is exactly the same thing if they are continuous signals. We can also talk about convolution. And so if it's optical stuff coming into the camera and we do it before we draw point samples, it's going to be some kind of continuous convolution. Uh, so um, there is a flash demo. Uh, let's see. Let me show you that demo. So you can uh, look at this. Yeah, yeah, this is not supposed to run on my laptop either. <laughs> that one I could bypass. The other one, the other one I couldn't. Uh, so this is a fun applet where here's the input signal and here's the filter. But you can just think of them as two functions. And um, they are being convolved with one another. So this is being implemented as a discrete approximation of a continuous convolution, if you'd like, just so that the and let's see, here's a small rectangle, and you can see it blurs it out a little bit. It's replacing every point with some average of, of uh, a number of points here. And there's a bigger rectangle. So, um, yeah. And here's a Gaussian. Here's a Sharpen. 
where it goes below zero here. And so you're subtracting some values and adding other values, and it actually adds frequency content effectively. Um, there's one that shifts it to the side, and all it does is it takes this, the original signal and shifts it. Uh, and then we can play games. So we can, you know, let's, you can have a lot of fun. Oh, normalize. So it normalizes by, the, it makes sure that the uh, area under that is one, so that the height of this is the same as the height of that. So you can play games with this applet. It's kind of fun. You know, draw your mother here or whatever. You okay. So um, there are two-dimensional analogs to this as well. So we can talk about a 2D discrete version, which is just uh, two nested sums. And we can talk about 2D continuous, which is two nested integrals, computing exactly the same thing. And if I go back for a minute um, to the applet, here is a discrete approximation of the continuous one, and we can do exactly the same thing. There is, let's see, the big rect, and you can see how it's blurring out uh, that. And you can, you can uh, have all kinds of fun with this. So uh, let's do a custom just for the fun of it. And let's, uh, it's going to be hard to do from here. Um, so let's make that minus, oh, let, sorry. No, no, let's start with big rect and then custom and then make this minus like that. in the first two columns. Okay, got a little problem with normalization, so we should probably take the middle one and increase it. And I think the right answer is 0.82. There, that brings it back up. Or I could just press the normalize button. So do you see what I'm computing here? Blurring in X. Oh, sorry, uh, sharpening in X. I've got negative here, blurring in Y. So I, let's see, I should actually put negatives here as well. Uh, I'll make it a little bit more obvious. Ugh. Sharpening in X, blurring in Y, astigmatism. I seem to be a fan of astigmatism. <laughs> Okay, so you can have some fun playing with this. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so pre-filtering <coughs> reduces aliasing. And here's a, another way to think about that. So every fourth pixel in X and Y produced this where the text was ruined. But if instead I convolved by a four by four pixel rectangle, that was the 2D analog of just that rectangle function that I showed in the applet, and then sampled every fourth pixel, I don't destroy the text. You might not be able to read it, but it doesn't look like something different. It isn't high frequencies masquerading as low frequencies. Okay, so um, let me, let's go through what happens in photography. So we have enough theory now that we can, in a fairly formal way, write down what happens uh, in a camera. So we can think about um, some input signal, x, y. So this is the image coming through the lens and being focused uh, on the sensor. And let's say it's um, a tree and a landscape some mountain landscape, sort of like that. And it has frequencies that are too high to be reproduced. And so I convolve it with some function. So we'll call this f of x, y, and we'll call this g of x, y. And let's say it's a rect in two dimensions. So this is minus 1 half. Oh, sorry, this is positive one half, minus one half, and its height is one. Uh, 
and we can evolve those two, what we'll end up with is something that's a little bit hard to draw, but you know, it's kind of fuzzy. There's the tree, and there's the mountain landscape, and the whole thing is blurred out. And how much we want to blur it depends on what our final sampling rate will be. And then we're going to multiply that, and now there's a special function that we use to denote that multiplication. Um, it is called SHA, or the sampling function. And it's just a bunch of spikes. And you can think of this as a grid going back, and there are the 2D grid of these things. Okay? And what we'll end up with when we're done is just a bunch of points. And you can those are the pixels. And they'll have different intensities that represent the blurred landscape. So if the width of this is equal to the spacing between the samples, then I can re-represent what I have computed here using a much simpler way to think about it, which is that I just take the original scene and compute averages over abutting rectangles like that. And each average then becomes one sample of the final. To a first approximation, that's what a camera does. These are pixels. Okay, so Zalman is grimacing over there. Just, just hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> so if, again, if the width of this is equal to the spacing between that, then this calculation is equivalent to independent averages. Okay, now, what happens if those averages, uh, let me draw it on the same one. Suppose those averages were like this. So either the box was small or, or the spacing between them was a little bit too wide. What's going to happen there? I might get aliasing. I, I drew this in specifically so I almost missed the tree. I can miss features. That's going to be high frequencies masquerading as low frequencies. So you want to make sure that your pixels fill the space between them, or there's some optical element in there that makes sure that they do, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. What happens instead if the rectangles look like this? In other words, they overlap. Then it's going to be blurry. Then I pre-filtered too much. Those are the kinds of trade-offs. And you can think of it just as this spatial convolution followed by sampling. Aliasing, blurring. And we'll have a trade-off between them. And it may not be a rect function either. It might be something else. I'll make this concrete on Wednesday when we talk about micro lenses and anti-aliasing filters. But I want you to un kind of understand how it fits into the theory for aliasing and sampling and pre-filtering here. So I've kind of said that here. Um, 2D rect followed by sampling on a 2D grid. We call it a pixel. If the rect filter is of width equal to the sample spacing, this is like measuring the average intensity, which is what a camera does. And if it's too narrow, it leaves aliasing. If it's too wide, it leaves blurring. So any questions on that? Let's see a big story on there. Yeah. Sorry? Where does this pre right, so that's what I'm going to talk about on Wednesday, where it happens. It happens in the anti-aliasing filter that is inside the camera. And I'll show you micrographs of that on Wednesday. Yeah? Does a cell phone need an anti-aliasing filter, or mm -hmm. is the MTS sufficient to filter down the signal and you don't need it? Um, it needs one, and it has one. It's got micro lenses. Yeah, you can't completely get rid of it. And, and in fact, the rect is not a great anti-aliasing filter either. 
Uh, its Fourier transform is the sinc function, which has all these lobes. But um, yeah, uh, um, all modern sensors will have some kind of anti-aliasing filter on them. Yes? I, I don't know if it's a marketing thing, but I've seen a recent demo of a sun filter used by that. And I will show you. Yeah, so the question is about removing anti-aliasing filters. I will show you an example of that on Wednesday. I'll show you the pictures before and after removing the anti-aliasing filter. Gradient over large, well, I mean, JPEGs still can produce artifacts like that where there appears to be a gradient across pixels. I will talk later on in the course about exactly how JPEG works and we'll see where those gradients come from. That's not the same thing as this. That's one of the frequency components and if you don't include all the frequency components, then you can get those gradients across blocks that are about eight by eight pixels. That's a different artifact. Question? Um, well, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> if you took point samples, you would get a lot of aliasing. Uh, pixels at least have some area, and th so even if there were not a special anti-aliasing filter, they remove some of those high frequencies by doing that average. Actually, my question is, is PXY intended to be the pre-filtering or the yes. combination of the pre-filtering and the sampling function? Uh, this is the sampling function. This is the pre-filtering. Uh, if I convolve that, I'm producing another continuous image. Now, this isn't actually the way the camera works. The camera does it like that. Right. But this is the mathematical sequence. Maybe we should take it offline. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So let's talk about upsizing, downsizing in a program like Photoshop. So there's an additional step that I haven't really talked about. If you start with a discrete image, and then you want to change its size. We haven't really given, I haven't given you enough theory to do that. I'm starting with a continuous image. So there's another step, which is uh, in the theory pipeline, which is that you have to have some mechanism for taking a discrete image and reconstructing a continuous image. So let me show you that, how that would look in theory. So that can be represented using the same machinery that we've talked about already. And the way to think about that is, let me show this in one dimension, a little bit easier. We'll take some sampled function uh, of x, and we will convolve it with something. So. Let's start by convolving it with that, where this is 1 half, and minus 1 half and 1. Okay, so it's a rect. If we convolve these two, one way to think about convolution, and this might help you for any convolution you want to think about, is uh, if you are convolving a discrete image by a function, you can think about it as replacing the sample with a vertically scaled copy of this function everywhere. See what I'm doing? That is the result of com. If you work through the integral, you'll get the, the simple English way of doing it that I just said. You just replace each sample with a vertically scaled copy. So that will be the output. That's called pixel replication if we were in two dimensions. Mm, let's try a different convolution kernel. Let's try one that looks like this, where this is 1 and minus 1 and 1. It's got the same area, so we don't have to worry about the overall image brightening or dimming. And so what this will do is Again, think of it as replacing each sample with a vertically scaled copy of that. That will do, whoops, where did my other one sample go? And then the upper envelope, the sum of all those will be something that looks like that. That's linear interpolation. 
linear interpolation is just convolution by this thing called a tent function or a Bartlett function. There are lots of other reconstruction. So this is sometimes called R of X or R of X, Y in two dimensions, the reconstruction filter. And you can imagine others. So here's one. One, two. So that's a bi that's a cubic. And that will make a smoother reconstruction. So the way to think about upsizing or downsizing a discrete image is you first have to reconstruct it. So you can think about it as being multiplied by one, uh, sorry, convolved by one of these reconstruction filters to yield a continuous function. And then if you are downsizing, you then need to convolve again to blur, to remove high frequencies that you don't want to see. And then you finally point sample at the new rate. Now, in practice, you can combine this filter, the reconstruction filter, with this filter, if you're downsizing, which is the pre-filter for the second sampling operation, because convolution is associative. And so there's only one filter that you need to apply in practice. It will turn out to be a discrete filter, since you're applying it to a discrete, uh, sorry, a discrete convolution, since you're applying it to a discrete image. And so it's really fairly simple to compute this thing. You just have to choose your filters carefully. So that's what I mean by simplified into a single discrete convolution. So let me show you what that looks like. So upsizing by 16x, oops, sorry, by 16x. So let's just look at that one part. And here is a nearest neighbor, which is pixel replication, which is this one. And here is bilinear, which is the second one. And bicubic, I don't see a whole lot of difference. Maybe the second, the third one's a little bit sharper than the second one. By the way, this is an Alaska baneberry. It's one of the most poisonous things known to man. Six of them will stop your heart. This is from Glacier National Park. Okay, so that's leaf is the <laughs> leaf. I didn't sit there and chew it. <laughs> so that's upsizing. So downsizing. Now we have to incorporate that other filter. And so this is Vancouver. And if we just use point sampling for downsizing, in other words, don't attempt any reconstruction or pre-filter for the second sampling step. Let me blow that up just so you can see it here. And you get aliasing. You can see the aliasing there. It's high frequencies masquerading as low frequencies. Uh, but if we use a bicubic, um, we can get a better result. So that bicubic should be convolved with some other filter to remove low frequencies. It could be just expanded. It could be multiplied by Gaussian. There are lots of things you can do there. But there have to be two filtering steps, which we can combine into one convolution. And that will now downsize, and you don't see any aliasing. This is highly simplified. But I want you to understand this notion of reconstruction, new pre-filter, resampling, and that because of the associativity of convolution, you can combine those two filters. So it's just one filtering step. But I want you to be able to think about it separately. And so aliasing frequencies. You could reduce it by pre-filtering, which is multiplication in the frequency domain or convolution in the spatial domain. And then in photography, it's a pixel size rect, although we'll talk about anti-aliasing filters next time. So that, that's why that's grayed out. Any questions about this? Now we're going to switch and we'll, we'll talk for the last few minutes about uh, quantization. Let's see if there's anything on the dory. Fovion and Fuji sensors arrange color pixels differently. Are they trying to affect sampling aliasing? I will talk about the Fovion um, next time. They arrange their pixels vertically stacked for a different reason. That's for color, not for sampling. The Fuji is, is that the big pixel, small pixel? That it's, a, it's a non Bayer color filter array. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Um, uh, let me look at a Fuji, at, at which Fuji sensor, because there's some, that are, some Fuji sensors that are big and small for high dynamic range. But uh, Zalman is saying probably the one he's talking about is uh, just, okay, let me look at it later. I'll post something on it. I don't want to, I don't want to so answer without looking at it. Yeah? Color, uh, right. Um, yeah, let's talk about that next time. I'll, I'll have some diagrams of the Fobion sensor next time. Not, not really. It's not aliasing, actually. It's just a different way of, of uh, sampling the color. Yeah. Okay. Quantization. So let's just make sure we never, ever confuse these two. They're different processes. The image is a function a vector function, if you'd like, if it's red, green, blue, of a vector quantity, x or xy or xyz, um, and we sample the domain and we quantize the range. And those are separate processes, so we don't talk about aliasing artifacts in range, uh, in, in brightness. We talk about quantization artifacts. So this is an analog image that's been digitally sampled. Uh, Quick quiz, has that been pre-filtered before it was sampled? You ought to be able to look at an image right away and see whether it's been pre-filtered. Yeah. yeah, it's been pre-filtered because there are pixels here that are lighter than any of the pixels here. It's an average with the background, so it has to have been pre-filtered. You'll get good at this after a while. And then it's been quantized, and it can be quantized to different numbers of bits. So let's look at different numbers of bits. So there's a picture uh, I took at Stanford. And here it's being represented as eight bits of red, green, and blue, so 24 bits per pixel. And here's six bits for each of red, green, and blue. Probably can't see any difference. There's five bits, so I can begin to see something funny going on in the background. See this in the grass? Four bits begins to get... She still looks all right, but the, the smooth gradients don't and three bits of each. So now she doesn't look so hot either. Um, so solutions to these quantization problems, which appear as contouring. One is dithering. So dithering means that um, at every pixel, you will, if you're in between, if you only have, let's say, eight, bit, uh, eight, um, uh, eight bits total, so let's say three bits, three bits, two bits, for red, green, and blue. So you three bits of red, you only have a choice between zero and seven, or zero up to seven. So if you're halfway in between um, red value three and red, red value four, you will flip some of the pixels to red value three and some of the pixels, adjacent pixels to red value four. That's a simple way to think about dithering. So you'll end up, end up with a spatial pattern. And you can think of it as trading off spatial resolution to achieve the missing bit depth resolution. And it looks pretty good on this. So we can do it even better if instead of uh, making three bits, three bits, two bits, well, there aren't that many blues in this scene. So let's do it adaptively. So adaptively, where it just allocates colors from a, from a list of 256 colors according to what it finds it needs. And you can imagine all kinds of clustering algorithms that do that. And then if we dither that in addition, it looks really good. So you don't need 24 bits. You can do a pretty good image for most, most images. Let's remember that dithering is not the same as half-toning. So half-toning is a, a process in printing where you only have a palette of three or four primaries. You have no intermediate. It's just ink of a certain color. And you make the dots of a different size. So it's quite different. Um, and then if you stand back far enough, it looks fine because you kind of integrate in your eye. So half-toning is dots of a different size, and dithering is flipping different pixels uh, to different colors. Both are applicable to either full color or black and white, and both make this trade-off between spatial resolution and bit depth. And so you can do binary dithering between just black and white. You can do grayscale dithering. You can also do grayscale half-toning, where it's just black and white dots that are bigger and smaller, and that's what a newspaper does. Okay, so sampling is where, uh, is where um, you measure a function in, in its domain. 
Uniformly spaced samples is a sampling rate. If you don't sample enough, you get aliasing. You can avoid it by pre-filtering. Quantization is the range of an image. You specify the bit depth. If it's too low, you get contouring, not aliasing. And you can reduce it by dithering or half-toning if you're printing. So let's just make sure we always keep those two separate. Any questions about that? OK? If not, then we're finished for today. On Wednesday, we'll talk about sensors and sensor architectures, and we'll get really specific now that you have this theory under your belt.